So we are continuing in our series in the book of James. Today we're going to be looking at continuing in James 3, today starting at verse 13, and then going into chapter 4. So we are going to work through this. If you brought your Bibles today or if you got it on your remote, I invite you to follow along, or you can just follow along on the screen as we work through this particular scripture today. So let's start at James chapter 3, verse 13. If you are wise and understand God's ways, prove it by living an honorable life, doing good works with the humility that comes from wisdom. All right, two things real quick on this. First of all, please remember that James in chapter 3 is speaking to people who feel like they want to be leaders in the church, teachers in the church. Now, this speaks to uh, the first audience that heard these words, but I think it speaks to us too. Because we need to remember that if we are going to teach the Word of God, we need to understand it as well. And the way in which we understand it is by living it. I love the way James says it. He says, prove it. I think that should be our next shirt. It's going to say, are you a Christian? Prove it. Because I think that's really important. If we're going to call ourselves Christians, if we're going to study the Word of God, then the Word of God needs to help change us and shape us into the people that God has called us to be. In other words, we need some application to it. Now, in this particular scripture, it talks about how we need good works with humility that comes from wisdom. Wisdom. That's what we're talking about a lot today is wisdom. So is there a difference in your mind between wisdom and knowledge? What do you think? Is there a difference between wisdom and knowledge? Yes, I think there is. Now, what is the difference? Well, I'm going to say that the difference is application. You can have knowledge of something and do absolutely nothing with it. Or you can apply that knowledge. Here's my example. So again, when I got up this morning, it was still relatively cold, although this morning I do believe it was in the 60s when I first got up. One of the first things a lot of us do, especially in this time of year, is we check our phones to see what the weather is going to be this morning. We want to see what the high temperature is. How many of you checked to see what the high temperature was this morning? Absolutely. So you had knowledge of what the high temperature was going to be. That is knowledge. Now, how many of you decided what you were going to wear today after you had the knowledge of what the high temperature was? Did you dress according to what the high? Yes, that is application. You are showing great wisdom. You took knowledge, you applied it to life, and there you have wisdom. Now, that works with temperature, but it should also work with the Word of God. We don't study the Word of God simply to have knowledge of the Word of God. We study the Word of God to have the knowledge that then we can apply to make it wisdom. And James here is talking to people who want to be leaders or teachers in the church, and he's saying, listen, what you're teaching, you need to live you need to be applying it. Now, what if you attended Bible study this week, and whoever your teacher was, or even a sermon, and let's say they studied uh, a sermon on being peacemakers, and then you went home, and by the next Sunday, let's say it was on a Wednesday. Let's say on Wednesday you went out to a restaurant, and you saw that same teacher screaming and yelling at a waitress because they got their order wrong after they had just led a study on peacemakers, how would you feel? Would you be excited to go to the next Bible study? Maybe you would just so you could say, um, excuse me, I saw you last Wednesday. But we need to learn that if we're going to teach it, we need to be applying it to our life. That is the application that comes and becomes wisdom. And we all need God's wisdom in our life. It does us no good to have knowledge of the Bible if we do nothing with it. It's simply the Word of God. What gives it meaning is when we apply it to our life and we begin to change and be transformed by what it says. If you read that today was going to be 80 degrees and you came to this church wearing a wool sweater, we would all be concerned about you. The same way, if you're going to be a teacher or a leader and you're out there screaming and yelling at people, we are all going to be concerned about you. 
Do you get what I'm saying? All right, there's enough on that. Let's keep going. All right, verse 14. But if you are bitterly jealous and there is selfish ambition in your heart, don't cover up the truth by boasting and lying. For jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. Such things are earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and evil of every kind. Anyone want to admit that sometimes they get jealous? I know I do. Sometimes we need to admit that sometimes we have selfish ambition. Ambition in itself is not bad. I believe that God gives us ambition to get things done. But when it is selfish ambition, that's when it's a problem. When it is ambition that is simply about you, getting you ahead, getting you the best of whatever it is, then it's a problem. Then it can be demonic, it can be sinful. What God desires for us to have an understanding of is that the world does not revolve around us. Now, you probably already know that. If you don't, hear this today and know from now on the world does not revolve around you. It really doesn't. And it shouldn't. God has created this world, and God desires to be the center of that world as he desires to be the center of our life, every single one of us. Now, when you were first born, you were the most selfish thing on the planet. That's how babies are born. Whenever they want something, they cry. And some babies cry a lot. They're very, very selfish. They don't think about their mother sleeping. They don't think about anything else but what they want when they want it, and they will demand it by crying. That is selfish. I expect that from a baby. I expect that from a baby up until a certain age. But hopefully, as that baby is growing and maturing, they are beginning to learn that they need to understand the other people around them. And that the world is not simply about them, but it's about all of us. As you were born, God also created you to be needy, and he created you to fulfill that need through a relationship with Jesus Christ. So even if you don't want to admit it, you just need to know you're needy. Some of us fight our whole entire lives because we just don't want to be needy, but you were created that way. But it's how we fill that neediness. Sometimes we do that through selfish ambition. We work and work and work and work to try to succeed, to try and build up all these things for ourselves. That's selfish ambition. We want to get ahead of everybody else. It doesn't matter who they are or who you've got to step on. That's a problem. That is selfish ambition, and that is sinful. When we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we take ourselves out of the middle of the equation and we put Christ there. And it's being in relationship with Christ that begins to change the entire world around us. It's no longer about our pleasure. It's no longer about what we want when we want it. It's about serving Christ and making a difference for Christ's sake. But what we find out is when we do that, we begin to live our best life possible. So often when we try and lead life simply as a selfish ambition, what we want, when we want it, what we think is going to make us happy, and so often what we think will fulfill us by our own desires, we end up hurt. We end up lost. We end up sometimes more empty than we ever thought possible. And we found out other people begin to steal things from us in our emotions and in every other way. And that is nothing of what God desires. That's why rather than jealousy and self-ambition, God is looking for us to reap the rewards of a harvest of living for him. Joy and peace, contentment, happiness, all of those things we find in living for Christ and Christ alone. Not through selfish ambition and certainly not through jealousy. When we live our life that way, all we're doing is piling stuff on our backs. 
and we begin to carry it around and it begins to just weigh us down. Thomas Adams says this, the covetous man or woman is like a camel with a great hunch on his back. Heaven's gate must be made higher and broader or he will hardly get in. Christ came to scrape all that stuff off your back. He came to, to let it loose, that you can live life free of all of that, that you can enjoy all that God desires for you in life. Life in Christ is amazing. It's life changing and altering. It's the best life ever. And that's what James is trying to get through to these teachers. Let your students see your life in Christ. Live your best life in Christ. There's no other way. There's no better way. And then he goes on in verse 17. But the wisdom from above is first of all pure. This is God's wisdom. The wisdom that we get from the Holy Spirit reading scripture. It's pure. It's also peace-loving gentle at all times, and willing to yield to others. It is full of mercy and the fruit of good deeds. It shows no favoritism and is always sincere. And those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. Doesn't that sound good? That's better than a crop of the best tomatoes. A crop of righteousness, all that God desires for us. And I'll tell you, this is a hard lesson to learn, but it's an important lesson to learn. I remember the, the first time I really, really learned this lesson. And mine was an issue of self-ambition and jealousy, just like it talks about in Scripture. It happened to me at college. I went to Ball State University. While I was at Ball State, I was part of the Wesley Foundation there, which was a student ministry. When I first went to Ball State, I lived in the dorms. My roommate, her name was um, Michelle. She introduced herself this way. Hello, I am Michelle Teresa Johnson. Who introduces themselves with their middle name? But that's what she did. Well, Michelle Teresa Johnson and I, we became pretty fast friends. Michelle was also a Christian, that was nice. But Michelle did not was not brought up in church. Her family did not attend church. Her parents never attended church. But she had made some friends in high school her freshman year, and they invited her to their youth group. Michelle began attending this church youth group. And after she attended youth group for so long, she decided she wanted to try church on Sunday morning. And so she would spend Saturday night with some of her friends. She would go to church with them on Sunday, and then they would bring her home that afternoon. And so that's how Michelle got acquainted with church. And that's how she got acquainted with God. So it was a little different than the way that I grew up. And because of Michelle's home life, it was a divorce um, family, and there were a lot of complications in that divorce. Michelle had a lot of issues that she dealt with. Not that I didn't have issues too, I did. But I really felt like God had put me there to help Michelle to begin to work through some of her things, as she also helped me to work through some of my things. So our freshman year, I attended Wesley Foundation. She actually attended a different student organization. But every once in a while, she'd come down to Wesley with me. Uh, she went to Bible study down there one time and just a couple of other things. And we, were, we, we had a great time our freshman year. Our sophomore year, we decided to be roommates again, and we stayed in the same dorm. So freshman and sophomore year, we were in the dorms together. Again, Michelle... Um, was working through some of her situations from her home life growing up. She did attend Ball State. She attended these other uh, student organizations, religious organizations on campus. By her junior year, she was actually coming down to Wesley Foundation a little bit more and participating in the ministries because she'd gotten to know people and they'd gotten to know her and, and it was working out pretty well. Our junior year, both of us lived off campus. She went one way and I went another. We were still really good friends though, but she just moved into an apartment with some girls and I moved into a different apartment with some other girls. We'd still get together regularly. I'd see her down at Wesley Foundation or see her around on campus and, and things went well. Senior year. 
Senior year, I applied to be the resident at the Wesley Foundation, which means I lived in an apartment and got to use their kitchen. I had been a part of Wesley now for three years. This was my fourth year. And Wesley Foundation had a construct where they had the student ministries who were president, vice president, secretary, treasurer, you know, all of those normal things that you see in a lot of organizations. My senior year, I knew it was my time to be president. It was. I deserved it. I had been there every single year. I had helped the organization. I was always around doing things. Now I was even serving as their staff resident. It was my time to be president. And I wasn't alone in that. Many other people said, you know, it's your turn to be president as well. I wasn't fully all in my own head. Other people were helping blow up my head as well. I was sure that it was time. I deserve this. So I remember when the director, um, and most of you aren't going to know her at the time, her name was Cindy Reynolds. She was the director of the Wesley Foundation. She brought me in to have a conversation. And she said, you know, Karen, uh, we are in the process of, of determining who's going to be vice president, president, secretary, treasurer, all that stuff of Wesley. And this coming year, you are going to be the staff resident. Yeah, I know. I applied. You hired me. Well, we decided this year that the staff resident should not also be the president. What? What are you talking about? It was last year. Well, we know it was last year, but we had some problems with that, and so this year we want to divide it. You want to divide it now? When it's my turn? Well, I, we realize that that's going to be hard, but we still think that this is the best decision. I got to tell you, I was angry. I deserved that presidency. I had earned that presidency. This was not fair. I was angry, but not as angry as her next sentence. So this next year, we've picked somebody to be president. Can you guess who it was? It was Michelle. I was like, excuse me? Um, yeah, we knew that would be hard for you. Oh, <laughs> really? Did you think that? Huh? So, Michelle, the one that I brought here, the one that I have helped so often, the one who's been here off and on, the one who is my friend, you're going to make her president. Yes. And we know that you will support her and help her through. Oh, <laughs> do you now? Really? So, so let me make sure I have this straight. So, Yes, I'm going to be the staff resident. Yes, I am the one who deserves to be president, but you're going to put Michelle, and then you want me to support her and help her. Is that what I'm hearing? Now, I want you to know, none of those words I just said, I said out loud. <laughs> and here's why. I was brought up in the church. When you get brought up in the church, you know exactly what to say and how to say it. Well, if, if that's what you think is best, I understand. I will certainly do my best to support her and whatever it is that you might need. Those were my words. Is that how I felt inside? Absolutely not. But sometimes when you grow up in the life of the church, you begin to learn the proper things to say out loud, to make it look like everything is good, when inside you are racked with jealousy and self-ambition. Am I the only one in the room that does that? I may be. So when I left that office, I was hotter than I have ever been in my life. Now, I don't mean hot in terms of heat. I mean hot. I was angry. I was just absolutely angry. And I just stormed out of there. That whole next summer, I actually had stayed down in Muncie. In case you really want to know, I worked for the Muncie Public Library. Now, that was a job. Lived off campus, preparing for the next school year. Michelle went home and uh, lived where she is from, which is around the Indy area. And I didn't talk to Michelle all summer. But here's the thing, Michelle really didn't talk to me either. And I think Michelle was scared because Michelle knew I had wanted to be president. And they didn't give it to me even though it was mine. She took it. 
At least that's how I felt. It wasn't until two weeks before school, I was already there, she had moved back on campus, and she came and she met with me, and, and we talked about what was going to happen, and all I could say was, hey, listen, you're who they picked, good luck. It wasn't very friendly. But at the same time, it wasn't overly mean either. I mean, I was a Christian, I knew how to, how to walk that line. It wasn't until I had moved in as the RA, or the staff resident, and we had our first meeting that she ran, and it went awful. There was such a joy inside of me. (laughs) Isn't that awful? But it's true. I'm just trying to be honest with you. And it was later, like a couple couple days later, that she came into my apartment where I was living uh, as a staff resident, and she was all upset because she knew it didn't go well. And it was in that moment that I had a choice to make. Because it was in that moment that my actions were going to speak even louder than my words. What was I going to do? I was still racked by jealousy. This was all about self-ambition. I deserved that position, and I didn't get it. That wasn't fair. I had worked hard for that position, and I didn't get it. And she took it out from under me. That's how I was feeling at the time. But when she walked in and she sat down and she started crying, it was one of those moments when I knew God was at work inside of me. Because I knew in that moment it was God working and not me working. Because in that moment, my heart just softened for Michelle. And all of that jealousy and all of that self-ambition somewhere slipped away. And I saw how much pain she was in. Because I knew she already dealt with so much self-doubt. And when that occurred, it was just like a pummeling all over her on her again. And she came because she thought it would be a safe place. And so it was in that moment that I had to prove that I was a Christian. I had to be sincere. I needed my outside and my inside to be the same. So as she sat there crying, I began to confess to Michelle. I confessed to my anger and my pain. I confessed to my resentment and my jealousy. I confessed how I thought I deserved it and I was angry. And that I was not only angry at her, but I was angry at God. Because how could God have done this? I mean, it was a crazy experience. But it was also one of the most healing experiences. Because I began to understand this scripture so much better. And I, I want to read 17 to you again. It says, But the wisdom from above is first full, is first of all pure. It's pure. It's also peace loving, gentle at all times and willing to yield to others. Oh, isn't yielding sometimes hard? It's full of mercy and the fruit of good deeds. It shows no favoritism and is always sincere. I think that sincerity is what got me. I had for so long made things on the outside look good. I looked the part of the really good Christian with the servant heart. But inside, I was at war with myself. I was at war with God. It was a spiritual battle. And it wasn't until I began to confess that finally I began to win that battle. Now, we were able to heal the relationship, and I was able to help her to to figure out some things that could change. And she was a great president that year. And I was a great staff resident. I began to realize that God had different things for me than what I thought they were going to be. I began to yield. I finally began to to soften where I could say, God, your will and not mine. I began to understand what it means when life isn't fair. You ever have a kid tell you that? It's not fair! 
My parents used to always say, it's not fair, and that's why you need Jesus. Because life will never be fair. And the one thing we learn the closer we get to Jesus is life will never be fair. That's why we need Jesus. It doesn't matter what you deserve. It doesn't matter how hard you have worked for something. Christ in us begs us to yield. And when it doesn't work out the way we think it should work out, that should move us closer to God because we need that grace even more. Otherwise, it's that war inside of us. And if we've been in the church long enough, we know the right words to say, but internally, we're still at war. There's still that anger, which is always caused by pain. Because 18 says, and those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. It wasn't until I confessed and I yielded that I could be that peacemaker. And that became everything. So the question becomes, what's the war that's raging inside of you? Where is the place where it's about jealousy and self-ambition instead of about Christ? Because then we move into chapter 4 and it says this, What is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. Now, if you're not sure what that means, all you need to do is watch just one movie on the Hallmark Mystery Channel because they all have that at their center. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it, so you fight and wage war to take it away from them. So often that war is internal, but sometimes it's external as well. We can be really good at quarreling and fighting, even we who are Christians. But then the next part of that verse in 2 says this, yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. Rather than all that selfish ambition and jealousy, we need to stop and seek after God what it is that God desires for us. But then it says, even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what you get that will give you pleasure. Sometimes we can ask God for so many things, but, but, but what's behind the asking? Is it what God wants, or is it what's going to bring you pleasure? Is it what God desires, or is it simply what you feel is going to satisfy you? That's an important difference. Because sometimes we have to acknowledge to God that we have needs that are not being met. Now, I believe that God will meet our every need or he will change the desire of our heart. Do you get that? He will either meet our need or he will change the desire of our heart. And that's a whole other story. But God is power enough he can do that to all of us. And he can do that for us. That's what God can do. That's what God's love and grace does. It begins to transform us from the inside out. Everything that is about us. And, you know, as stupid as it was to get jealous over being president of a Wesley Foundation for one year, we can find all sorts of stupid things to be jealous about. We can be jealous about somebody else's family and their children. How come my children can't be as good as their children? Or how come my house isn't like their house? Or or, how come this? Or how come that? Or there are lots of things to be jealous about. When God says, be satisfied by what I have given you because what you need and what will satisfy you is different than theirs. Stop comparing and rejoice and be thankful for what you have. And when you ask, trust that I will give it, but ask with the right motives, not out of selfish desire. 
but with what God desires for you. Because then we get down to verse 7. So humble yourselves before God. What does that mean? It means be open, be honest, be real. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. How's the devil act? The devil's the one telling you, you deserve it. You earned it. Life isn't fair. Set that stuff aside. That's not of God. Verse 8, come close to God and God will come close to you. God will always do that. I can't begin to tell you how much I learned that year as a staff resident. Because I began to seek after God's heart and God's desires in a whole new way for me rather than out of selfish ambition and what I felt I deserved. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts. For your loyalty is divided between God and the world. And that's what it comes down to. If your loyalty is to the world, then you think at some point the world is going to be fair for you. If you work hard enough, you're going to achieve. It doesn't always work that way. So stop putting your loyalty into the world. It will never be fair. Put your loyalty into Christ. Put your loyalty into God. Come close to him. Augustine says, he that is jealous is not in love. Fall in love with Jesus. And see all that he's doing in and through your life. And the places where you feel it's not enough, seek after God even more. Because he can change the desires of your heart. He can help you find real happiness, real love, real peace. As the band comes up for our close tonight, or this morning, I should say, I think what Paul or what James teaches us here applies to every one of us in our life. Because even as you're sitting here right now, you may go, you know what, Karen, life is really good. I'm not jealous of anything. Well, we could probably work through that a little bit. But the reality is, because we live in this world, there is going to be times when jealousy can begin to raise its head. Even though I had to learn that lesson as a senior in college, I wish I could tell you I never get jealous anymore, but there are still times when I do. But I have learned that in those moments when jealousy raises its head in my life, I begin to realize I'm the one with the problem, not the other person. It's me. And I have to begin to look at my walk with Christ. Have I stepped away a little? Am I, am I not relying on him? Am I trying to do too much on my own? What's going on? But the issue is always with me. And it's a reminder that I need to get back to Jesus. Because that's the only place where I truly find happiness. And I believe it's the same for all of us. Amen.